Hi, my name is George Bruder. I'm chairman of Endodontics and the director of the Advanced Specialty Education Program in Endodontics here at Stony Brook University School of Dental Medicine. I'm here to talk to you today about a unique change in endodontic therapy. With the help of engineers from Dentsply Tulsa Dental Specialties, Ove Peters and I have worked on a platform to conserve dentin. When we think about the importance of conserving dentin, immediately we think of Christine Sedgley. The cumulative loss of tooth structure through trauma, caries, and instrumentation has led to the weakening of teeth. With everyone's help, we have now developed a new platform, TrueShape. TrueShape is something that allows us to make more contact with canal walls with less apical transportation while conserving dentin. This has led to instruments that through time and temperature and proprietary techniques have made things that now conform to these 3D morphologies that we are all so intimate with while conserving dentin and increasing the overall strength of teeth. We've also now created the orifice modifier that allows us to have straight line access without removing too much dentin coronally which has subjected teeth to fractures for years. One thing we want to stress though is please, please make sure that you follow the technique card. All the results that you're seeing in our research is based on the technique given in the directions for use. I look forward to sharing these concepts with you and this technique as we're going to show in the following case. This is a good true shape case because these traditionally are wide or buccal lingually. So the morphology three-dimensionally is not something that's conical. This is something that's wider, it's more elliptical. And so if we address this as two different systems, this allows the file to conform to the natural morphology of the tooth, which obviously will make more contact with the canal walls. Okay, you can just lower your chin a little. Thank you. Can I go here, that? Yes, thank you very much. Place some lubricant slit first into the chamber, just gentle. And I'm just going to put a couple of coats of it in so that we have some that we can work into the canal so our file's not working dry. So I'm just going to let some of this deposit itself. And now I'm just going to approach the canal orifice. And now what I'd like to do is just very gently work that down, pull it back up and again, place it back down so that I have adequate lubricant at my tip. What I just did was I just scouted through my coronal segment, thinking of the elliptical canal as two separate systems. So right now I'm working down the buccal aspect and feeling the curvature in my mid third. Now I'm gonna very gently come out and see if there's a similar feel coming from the lingual which would demonstrate a potential type four that I'll see after I open things up. Now I'm going to leave irrigation in my canal system because I'm about to use a rotary instrument. This is the orifice modifier for opening things up coronally. This is, this is the orifice modifier made of proprietary metals. With its shape and size, this allows me now to address the natural morphologies coronally without over preparation and maintaining dentin for long-term success. And there we go. It runs at 300 RPMs. However, in calcified cases or unique anatomies, you can run it at 500 RPMs because it, the metallurgy is made for it. Thank you. Irrigation. When using the orbis modifier, I was taking the path, the natural morphology, and allowing the coronal segment of the canal to guide me. There was no brushing, no excessive amount of dentin being removed. If I feel there's something that needs to be removed, I won't do it with something like that. I'll modify it with an ultrasonic where I have direct line of sight and can control the amount of dentin removal. As you can see, coronally, I've addressed it as two separate canal systems. It's elliptical, wider buccal lingually, and as you can see, I'm taking it as two canal systems. That way, our files can conform to these anatomies, making even more contact. After opening up my coronal segment, I'm going to follow the rules that we all know from Iberola. And what I'm going to do is just go for an estimated working length of approximately 21 millimeters. Here's my indicator on my stopper. So I'm going to very gently now just give it a little sweeping curve. So now I'm going to enter into the canal. 
My main sweep so far, I've been able to detect going in a distal direction. After placing this in, I'm going to take my apex locator, place it above the stopper. Okay, and use a 25 millimeter length file so I have ample room for my lip, my file clip to go above my stopper. I'm going to very slowly advance my file apically. One of the things I like to do at this point before advancing, now I've tried to see and scout my apical segment, but before confirming a working length, what I'm going to do is relieve her occlusion so she doesn't fracture the tooth since she has a large temporary restoration and more importantly, she has some enamel that's undermined and some dentin. The reason this is not something of concern when we talk about the amount of tooth structure being removed is this is what's going to be reduced for the final restoration, which is going to be a crown prep. So this is going to be in occlusal uh, reduction anyway in our crown, but also minimizes fractures. Okay, suction. So now what I've done is I've just adjusted my stopper to these reference points that we smoothed off. So now we have really good reference point and we have our stopper at that point. So this is our working length. Right. 21 heavy. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. Irrigation, please. Now we're going to go to our path files to confirm our glide path. We're going to start off with a path file number 13. That's our purple band. And as we know, it has an O2 taper. With irrigant in the canal, I'm now going to use my rotary instrument to confirm my glide path. And here it is. We always want to make sure that we don't start it in the canal. So I do a dress rehearsal. One, two, three. It's not binding up top. So I'll pull it back out like this. And now activate before I enter in. And a nice smooth one, two, three. Excellent. And we always wipe our instruments with alcohol. This cleans the flutes, also then evaporates so that we can see the condition of our metallurgy. They'll check for elongation or unwinding. And very gently, as I said, we've now instrumented this as two separate systems coronally. So right now I'm going to very gently use the same instrument in the other side and confirm the same outcome, a good glide path. As you can see, there was some debris coming coronal. So now, because I used a rotary instrument, I used a path file 13, I'm going to irrigate and endoactivate, endoactivate it for five to 10 seconds after irrigating that out. This time, a path file number 16, set at 21 and a half. Thank you. And again, we don't want any binding prior to starting our file, so it's just gonna be a one, a two, and of course, a three. And here we go, one, two, and three, a confirmed glide path going down the lingual aspect of our ribbon-shaped canal system. Now, I'm going to go down the buckle system the same way, nice and easy. One, two, excellent. And there we go. So again, I just want to reemphasize, do not start your instruments, even your path files, in the canal. Always make sure that you're nice and free before ever starting and before they can advance like that, so that way you don't have any resistance upon starting. And now that we've confirmed our glide path, it's critical that we irrigate, we activate, and confirm our patency. When using True Shape, you want to remember that as flutes become clogged, they become less efficient. It's like your razor if you don't run it under water. So whenever using any rotary instrument, especially these, with their unique metallurgy, what you want to do is make sure you don't start it in the canal, but also you want to go three passes before you come out and clean off the flutes. So we don't want any, we don't want any resistance. So one, two, three, and out. And there's debris as we advance apically. Irrigation. And our needle is beginning to really advance for me. So we're getting good irrigation now. And we're well into our middle apical segment there and I'm only releasing my irrigant on the outstroke, never on the instroke. That becomes positive pressure. I want it to be released on the outstroke. Thank you. Back to my True Shape 2006, this time entering in from a lingual perspective, keeping these separate. And what I want to do now is make sure that we have a passive one, excellent, two, excellent, 
three. Excellent. Okay. And again, irrigation. Now back to our true shape, our 2006. And what I'd like to do now is just come in, make sure we have no binding up top. And one, and two, and three right in. And we're just shy of our working length and there's no reason to force it with good debris being pulled up. And again, irrigation. So we're gonna do a practice, as you can see, no binding when we start it. And here we go, one, two, three, to our working length and out. Clean off the flutes with alcohol, two by two with alcohol, irrigate. So after using the 2006, now going with the 2506, not only is it a change in tip diameter, but also its points of contact. And with its unique geometry, we're gonna very gently, one, two, three, and right to working length. And that's the buckle aspect of that. And very gently, I'm going to walk down the lingual aspect just once. And that's just up top coronally, not really worried about apical. Excellent. And now, irrigation. So that will complete our final instrumentation and our initial cleaning protocol. And now we're going to irrigate well. We're going to activate it, confirm patency, and begin fitting our obturation. Look at the buccal lingual direction of this canal and look at the fin off of this section right here, off the buccal aspect. And by instrumenting as two different canals, you can see how these instruments conform to the natural morphology. This way addressing the whole thing, the natural anatomy, all the way. Now Cumix, and with my needle set approximately three to four millimeters from my working length, I'm gonna very gently start depositing it into my canal. And I'm going to, as you see, progress more apically, and I'm going to begin to deposit on my outstroke. And I'm gonna irrigate with Cumix for approximately 60 to 90 seconds. My initial is me depositing it, rinsing and then irrigating deeper and deeper, passively on the outstroke. And once I do this for 15 to 30 seconds, I'm going to fill the canal and then endoactivate it for 15 to 30 seconds. And now my final part of disinfection, Cumix by itself depositing it for approximately 15 to 20 seconds more for a total of 60 to 90 seconds. I'll take my microsuction that's been cleaned off, place it into my canal, get drying on it there, take one dry paper point, set to length, and I'm gonna very gently place this into the canal, slide it down the wall, right to working length, just a half short so that way I can see it there. And I'm gonna hold that there for a second, pull it out, see how much moisture we have. As you can see, your paper point just bent, so you know that that's all moisture. Take a second paper point, also sent, set for our working length, here, very gently, place it in on the buckle aspect of the same preparation, right to there, hold it, and come out and tap. And as you can see, less bending occurring. Another one from the lingual aspect, and here we're down the lingual wall to working length. And just a little bit on its tip. This paper point is set for a half millimeter longer than my working length, so all I'm gonna do is very gently slide it down that 3D anatomy and come up short of that. She's right there, she's good. Now I'm going to take the gutta percha cone, and it's just like butter on corn. I'm going to push through to make sure that my mix is complete. And then I'm going to pull and gently remove any excess. I'm 
I'm going to take my cone, I'm going to place it into my canal, two-thirds of the way, pull it back up, then run it back through. That recoats my tip gently, so now I can send it right there. Now I have a great stop apically from the placement. Now, as you can see, I'm placed in my canal system with my master cone with sealer. I'm going to take my heated plugger. So now you're going to come in and you're going to cut across your material and touch the wall as your break point and then come out. Now when I do this, I have a heated segment that now I'm going to compress into this 3D anatomy. And we're now going to place this into it three-dimensionally. And I'm going to pack it the same way I instrumented it, making believe I have two separate canal systems, bringing everything off the wall. What I'm doing is I'm making a platform of gutta percha so that when I do my burn down, I now have a solid mass that will allow me to get better hydraulics as I penetrate apically. So right now I'm just doing a two to three millimeter segment. That's all I want from this to get my mass going. I'm gonna let off my tip, hold, and I just want to get this now to penetrate some heat in there, touch the wall, and out. Great. And now I'm going to take that moistened segment that I took, and I'm going to compress that down on top of the other one, and that's going to help me get even greater hydraulics on these masses, these segments that I'm slowly heating up and moving laterally and apically. One of the key things we have to remember that gutta percha for adhesive properties does not really stick to dentin. So what we do is we put a nice fine layer of our sealer back in our canal after our burn down because we actually got rid of it. So now this is our lubricant and adhesive again, just a thin coat like that, not much. Next, I'm gonna prime my needle. You always wanna prime your needle so you don't have an air pocket when you place it down inside your canal for releasing. So what you wanna do is you always wanna prime your needle just sit here and actually get it so you know that it's about to come out of your needle. If it doesn't, you're going to have an air pocket when you initially squirt. So now I'm going to place my needle all the way down on the mass that I vertically compressed. The reason why you don't want to just place it down inside the canal and start squirting is because now the other mass is cooled down. This needle is making direct contact with the other gutta percha. Why? Because I want the two of them to heat up at the same rate. So now when I activate my needle, I don't have a cold weld. It now forces itself out at the same temperature. So you always want to make sure you heat up the other gutta percha prior to squirting the other gutta percha in so that you don't have a segment because one can cool down the other and you sometimes will even see a void in your obturation and your backpack. So now we have the temperature more similar and this will allow for something that is more homogeneous and more readily packed to conform to the overall anatomy of the system. So here's the final radiograph for the case we just had. If you looked at it, tooth number 20 originally appeared to have a type 4 system, wine classification, but in reality it was very wide buccal lingually and rather than using conventional instruments like Gates glidens and other instruments that are brushed or large conical instruments to over prepare the coronal segment, we were able to use 3D conforming instruments which allowed us to have more points of contact in the dentin but not over remove. So this way we were able to retain dentin while making more canal wall contact. Also, when you look at the obturation, you'll notice a little bit more dense uh, fill in the apical segment with the gutta percha. The gutta percha is actually bending away from us. I felt this in my initial instrument. In my scouting instrument initially, it came out curved. It's bending towards the lingual aspect of this system. When I went down there with my initial instrument, rather than feeling my apex just in a straight way with a slight uh, curve, it required me to put a bigger bend on it to negotiate that natural anatomy. The true shape instrument was able to maintain this as you noticed. Be sure though, in order to have similar results to the research that we've done and is now being published, we must follow the directions for use. Many of us have adapted because of the anatomies that we face every single day, but this system, this brand, adapts to and conforms to the true morphology. In order to have those same results, please follow the directions closely. We look forward to hearing from you and your experiences. We hope to see you in the near future. Thank you.